Welcome to the salon to learn about Mass General Hospital, or MGH's Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. I want to welcome members of the MGH Psychiatry Leadership Council and the many, many friends who've been involved in advancing work in psychedelics for years. We're honored and grateful that you've chosen to be with us today. You'll get a behind the scenes look at this new center being brought to life at MGH, which is going to be formally launched in the fall. MGH is Harvard Medical School's primary teaching hospital and the hub for the Boston biomedical ecosystem. Now, for those I don't know, I'm Dick Simon, and I'm honored to be chair of the Center's Advisory Council. I spend all of my time doing what I can to advance psychedelic ther therapies for treating a wide range of mental health issues. I'm motivated both by the astounding data on the efficacy of these treatments and from having experienced the seemingly intractable nature of mental health through experiences and mental health issues in my own family. And MGH has been incredibly helpful to us, but our experience has reinforced that this field desperately needs new tools for better treatments. I'll let the doctors and scientists share more about the promise of psychedelics in dealing with mental health and why we need more research to understand, among other things, what really works and the why. I'm totally excited about this center for several reasons. First, the human resources. Now, the speakers today are too humble to say it themselves, that these are the world leaders in psychiatry, neuroimaging, and chemical neurobiology. They're bringing an exciting level of scientific inquiry, validation, and credibility to this space. Second, technology. MGH is where many of tomorrow's healthcare technologies are developed meaning that this center will have access to the most state-of-the-art tools for understanding psychedelics for mental health. Now, I'm most excited for this integration of psychiatry, neuroimaging, and chemical neurobiology to gain better understanding than we'd ever be able to do through purely clinical pursuits, learning the hows and whys of psychedelics and their interactions with and impact on the brain. In addition to the incredible research, MGH and Harvard's focus on this space through the center will have a huge impact on overall destigmatization of psychedelics, increasing mainstream legitimacy and interest in the potential of psychedelics and fostering collaboration between research institutions. Finally, leveraging MGH's role as Harvard Medical School's primary teaching hospital, this center has massive potential for educating the next generation of researchers and clinicians about the promising science and practice of psychedelic assisted therapies. Now we're all standing on the shoulders today of the pioneers who have worked to advance this space. And we're honored that so many leaders in this space, these critical figures are with us today. A special thanks goes out to our fellow advisory council members joining us today, including Michael Pollan, Robin Carhart Harris, Katya Malaskaiva, and last but certainly not least, Rick Doblin, who's worked for 34 years at the helm of MAPS and is now poised to make MDMA available to relieve suffering for, from PTSD. And he's in a major capstone campaign in collaboration with the Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative, which I'm honored, just, I'm honored to be a member of uh, in advancing and completing that. We're grateful that all of you are here with us today. Before I hand it over to Jerry, I wanted to expend a, extend a very special thanks to those who made possible the formation of this center. Wayne and Shoshana Blanc and Karen Susan, who have honored their late daughter and granddaughter, Ariel Susan, and my friends, George Goldsmith and Katya Malaskaiva, doing extraordinary work to advance this space. Today, we'll hear several presentations by the principals of the center, each highlighting a critical aspect of the center's work. This will be followed by your questions. Moving forward, you can learn more about the center, center's effort in a series of deeper dives, full programs with each of today's speakers, the first of which is in July with Bruce Rosen, focused on the role of advanced, advanced neuroimaging in understanding the impact of psychedelics. Now, the people you really want to hear from. You have their complete bio, so I'll be very brief. I'm honored to introduce my good, good friend, 
Dr. Gerald Rosenbaum, the founding director of the Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. Jerry is psychiatrist in chief emeritus for MGH's psychiatry department, which he stewarded as the top ranked psychiatry department in the US for 20 years and a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Jerry brings 47 years of experience as one of the preeminent psychiatrists and psychopharmacology experts in the world. Jerry will speak to his journey to the promise of psychedelics and the center's role in supporting treatment-resistant patients. Jerry. Thank you, Dick. And let me add my welcome to Dick's and, and to thank you all for joining. What we originally imagined would be a small salon for interested friends to hear about our Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics has attracted more than 220 of you as of this morning. Many of you have had long-standing interest in, or, or even stronger, a commitment to the advancement of psychedelic therapeutics. And some of you are long-standing friends and supporters of the Mass General and his Department of Psychiatry. And we hope our mission and vision brings exciting news today to both groups. For those of you new to this place, Mass General is Harvard's oldest and largest teaching hospital, is embedded in what many consider the nation's biotech center in Boston. Mass General is the world's largest hospital-based biomedical research institute with over $1.1 billion of annual funding, and neuroscience is a jewel in the crown. And MGH Psychiatry, where as Dick pointed out, I served as chair for the past two decades, with over 600 academic faculty of MDs and PhDs, currently ranked number one in the US and number one for 20 of the last 25 years, is the institution's most active clinical trial research department. And beyond excellence in clinical care and in training future generations of physicians and psychologists, those who choose to commit their careers here appreciate that our tradition expects us to work to advance the science and practice of medicine through research for the benefit of all. And, and to be clear, in this effort, we see other great institutions as our allies, not as our rivals, together against human suffering from illness and disease. My clinical and research career has focused on the understanding and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders and has always been about trying to determine what to do next for those who have not responded to or recovered with standard care. And I know from this experience and from the data that we are all in this together. The motto of our department's leadership council is no family goes untouched. And we know that when one family member is suffering, all who love them suffer as well. And given the prevalence of psychiatric disorders, if you or someone you love is not affected. You really have defied the odds. So what does it mean to have a so-called treatment-resistant psychiatric disorder? It can mean different things. It can mean waking each day with dread or self-loathing, wishing some disease would end your life, or planning to take your own life. It can mean sleepless nights and tearful days. It can mean irritability and rage directed at loved ones. It can mean starving oneself to death or allowing craving for a substance to override all that you hold dear, destroying your life and lives around you. It can mean never leaving home for weeks or months or years and missing all the wonderful celebrations in your family. And all of these states increase your risk for dire medical health consequences like heart, metabolic, and other brain diseases. So here we are in, embarked on an unrelenting journey of discovery of new and better treatments. And this journey has led us at this moment to this exciting waypoint of understanding the neuroscience of psychedelics, to use our advanced neuroscience tools to determine how these molecules allow the brain to change in a remarkable and expedited way, a phenomenon subsumed under the concept of neuroplasticity. When current treatments work, we see evidence of neuroplastic changes in the brain. But for some patients, we do not have the keys to unlock their neuroplastic potential. And we believe firmly that the psychedelic-based discoveries ahead promise to unlock a new era of therapeutics. As Dick mentioned, I began caring for psychiatric patients as a physician in 1973. 
and I am energized and eager to be now engaged in this exceptional effort to fully understand the mechanisms and potential of psychedelic agents for those who seek our help. The commitment to create the center has a unique backstory. A few years ago, in thinking about poor treatment responders, a group of us began to address a cognitive and emotional problem that underpins much of the suffering across many different psychiatric conditions, a phenomenon known as rumination, an often brutal, wearing, and unrelenting form of stuck thinking, of dwelling on painful thoughts, events, regrets, often in a form of inescapable and unsuccessful attempts at problem solving. When intense, rumination wears a person down. It increases with the severity of the psychiatric condition and can be the prodrome to relapse, but also can be an impairing and enduring residual symptom after treatment. The burden of rumination might lessen with our therapies, but typically resists our array of treatments. So we had formed a task force here to take on and study rumination. Now, those who are burdened by rumination, not surprisingly, have increased activity in the brain network most involved with self-awareness and self-consciousness, the default mode network. Around this time, I attended a psychedelic conference at the Broad Institute here in Boston, the Broad being one of our research partner institutions along with MIT and Harvard Medical School. And there I learned that some of the so-called ego dissolution effects of psilocybin are associated with decreased activity of this very default mode network. My colleagues and I wondered about studying psilocybin for rumination. In seeking to source psilocybin, I met Katya Malevskaya, who while reviewing our scientific resources, together we began to envision how we could do something bigger. Indeed, we could bring together a powerful team of clinician scientists and neuroscientists spanning the spectrum of expertise from molecule to neuron, from neural network to brain, from brain to patient, or as we say, from bench to bedside and from bedside to bench to create this center. With the subsequent support of donors, including Katja and George Goldsmith and the Blank and Susan families and their creation of the Ariel Susan Memorial Fund for Psychedelic Research at MGH, we have funded our critical initial human studies one of which is on subjects with resistant depression and severe rumination. After my 47 years of working to discover new methods and approaches to make treatment more effective and more enduring, and, and in particular to address the unmet need of those who are poorly served by current treatments, I am beyond excited and optimistic to have arrived at this moment, this moment of promise and opportunity. What we do here has the potential of one day changing millions of lives for the better. I want you now to meet and hear from the leaders of this team about the tools and vision that we intend to bring to bear on this project to understand how psychedelics work and to advance psychotherapeutic discovery in patient care. Dick. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, we're next gonna hear from Dr. Franklin King who's the Director of Training and Education at the Center. At, at this Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics and is also a clinical instructor at Harvard Medical School. He has had a long clinical interest in the healing potential of psychedelics and has lectured in numerous national conferences as well as teaching residents and medical students about psychedelics. He's undergone MAPS's training program protocol for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Franklin's going to provide a brief overview about the history and use of psychedelics, as well as to efforts taking place at the center to ensure that the next generation of healthcare workers and leaders are educated about this space. Franklin. So thanks so much, Dick. So I'm going to talk with you just a little bit about the history of psychedelics and some of the clinical opportunities that we see for the center. So it turns out that despite only recently coming to clinical attention in the so-called West, there's nothing new about using psychedelics as medicine. They've been used for thousands of years across many different continents, and that ranges from the use of iboga in West Africa to ayahuasca in the Amazon rainforest to peyote in the American Southwest, to amanita mushrooms in Siberia. 
but their potential as medicines wasn't quote unquote discovered by the West until the 1950s. And that ushered in a period of about 15 years of intensive psychiatric research focus, looking at things like anxiety, depression, neurosis, as we used to call it, and alcoholism. I think most people here probably know what happened next, which is that psychedelics became more widely used by the public. That led to a significant backlash with the federal government doing two things. One, they criminalized all the psychedelics. And number two, they very abruptly shut down all human research examining psychedelics and withdrew all federal funding. And that ushered in a period of about 30 years where there was really no human research examining psychedelics. Research resumed in the early 2000s, and we now have another 15 years of data. First and foremost, what have we learned? Well, we've learned a lot about safety, which is what we're always concerned about when we're doing any human clinical research. And it turns out psychedelics are actually quite safe when they're administered in clinical settings. First, medically or physically, they're very well tolerated. And so we have a number of studies now looking at patients with terminal cancer, with end-of-life heart failure, who are tolerating LSD and psilocybin without significant physical side effects. Also, despite being classified as drugs of abuse in many people's minds, psychedelics actually aren't addictive, and it's biologically impossible to become dependent on psychedelics. Third and most important is psychological safety. And so you probably are familiar with the difference between psychedelics and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. We're really talking about a psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. We're talking about an interaction of a medication, a brain state, and a therapy. And so therapy, preparation, integration afterward are all things that we need to take very seriously when performing this research. Psychedelics have a number of unique effects. So first, unlike many of the medications that I prescribe as a psychiatrist that may take many weeks to take effect, psychedelics, when they work, they work rapidly. And so we see studies where depression scores, where PTSD scores will drop very quickly by the next day. Secondly, when psychedelics work, the effect tends to not be very subtle. It's a robust effect. But third and most important, what I think really has led to the generation of so much interest in psychedelics is that the benefits are sustained. And so when someone responds to psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, there's a number of studies now finding that six months out, 12 months out, even in one of the MAP studies, 45 months out, people continue to have benefit. And that's after only one or maybe two psilocybin sessions or MDMA sessions. And so that really separates psychedelics from other medications that really only work as long as you continue to take them. I recognize some of this may be a review for some of you here, but I just want to illustrate that there's a number of different groups of psychedelics. So starting with the tryptamine, psilocybin, which is going to be in our first study, also LSD, ayahuasca, which has DMT in it. Then there's phenethylamines, which include things like MDMA, which is being researched for its use in PTSD. Mescaline, which really hasn't been researched. Then we also have ketamine, which has obviously generated a lot of interest over the last couple of years for its potential in rapidly reducing suicidal ideation. And then finally, Ibogaine, which is generating much clinical interest in its role in potentially alleviating substance use disorders, particularly opioid use disorder. And so all of these are compounds that we hope to study in the coming years at the center. And why do we wanna study these things? Well, first and foremost, for the alleviation of chronic psychiatric conditions. So things that are as diverse as treatment-resistant depression, to post-traumatic stress disorder, but also substance use disorders, alcohol use disorders, anxiety and depression that occurs at the end of life or in association with serious medical illness. These are entities that tend to be very difficult to treat and we have limited options for right now. Then also OCD. So there's evidence from a number of studies for all of these conditions that psychedelics may provide benefit. But not just limiting ourselves to studying so-called psychopathology. Psychedelics may also induce changes in more long-standing psychological characteristics. Things like temperament, things like personality, that are thought to be static over time, that really shouldn't change whether an individual is depressed or not. And yet we see studies where people several months after the psilocybin session may have increased openness or decreased neuroticism. And it turns out that these are changes that actually may protect people against future development of anxiety or depression. Also some evidence to show that psychedelics may lead to an enhanced appreciation for nature of obvious potential benefit given the climate crisis facing the globe also decreased orientation toward authoritarian political beliefs. And then finally, enhanced spirituality, which of course may confer benefits of its own. Finally, I'll conclude by just talking about my passion, which is in education, for which I think MGH is particularly and uniquely suited. So there's a couple of challenges that we see facing the field in the coming years as the FDA approves psychedelic assisted therapies. And so that's where the MGH Psychiatry Academy comes in, and we're very excited to partner with them. 
We have 65,000 members across 127 countries. We disseminate 100,000 educational items each year. And we work with clinicians and hospitals on delivering state-of-the-art mental health care. And we'll be partnering with the Academy to both develop innovative ways of training therapists, but as well as working with clinicians who may not understand psychedelics or understand who would benefit or who would be at risk of trying this therapy. And with that, I thank you, and I'll turn you back over to Dick. Thanks so much, Franklin. That's an amazing range of substances the center is going to be looking into, and the training possibilities are awesome. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bruce Rosen, director of the Athenula Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging at MGH, and the Lawrence Lamson Robbins Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School. Among his many contributions, he oversaw development of fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging. He's also been developing tools which are used worldwide in research centers and hospitals to study and evaluate patients with stroke, brain tumors, dementia, and neurological and psychological disorders. Bruce will share more about the types of imaging tools being brought to bear for the center's research. Bruce. Pleasure uh, to be here to uh, uh, very briefly describe uh, how we study uh, the living human brain uh, with our neuroimaging tools. So this starts with a fairly simple idea, which is that new tools to see can lead to uh, new discoveries. So uh, one of my own heroes, uh, I was an astronomy major as an undergrad, uh, was Galileo. So think about what he did with this simple tool, the uh, telescope. Uh, with that telescope, he was the first to see uh, sunspots on the sun, craters on the moon, uh, the myriad of stars that uh, made up uh, what otherwise seemed like uh, the cloud of the Milky Way, and his uh, detailed observations of the uh, moons around uh, Jupiter, the so-called Galilean moons, basically confirmed the Copernican view uh, of the uh, sun in the center of the universe rather than the Earth, and thus fundamentally changed man's place within that universe all around a simple tool that allowed him to see things that he hadn't seen before. So uh, at the MGH, we're very fortunate not just to be able to use tools, but actually to build the tools. There are actually more biomedical engineers uh, at the Mass General Hospital than there are at uh, MIT and Harvard University combined. Here's just uh, one example of the kind of tools that we built. Uh, these large coils for uh, MRI scanning, uh, this is called the brain bucket. And how does this make a difference? Well, routinely uh, today, based on this technology, uh, we've taken patients, for example, this patient with seizures who had a conventional MRI scan, a good quality scan, but was told that uh, there was nothing uh, seen on the image uh, and thus uh, nothing uh, to uh, uh, guide uh, further treatment. But with our uh, newer scans, uh, ultra high field MR and these array coils that we've built, we now can clearly see a small area of abnormality within this brain the smaller the area, the, the better. This is an easy surgical candidate, and this patient was operated on and now remains uh, seizure-free, all just because we were able to take a better picture. Now, of course, uh, just imaging the anatomy of the brain is fantastic, but what we're really most interested in is watching the working brain. And this all started about 30 years ago uh, when we uh, first published uh, the ability to image brain function uh, with magnetic resonance imaging, so-called fMRI, which I suspect many of you are familiar with. It's interesting, this very first uh, image looked at the visual system, and we know something interesting about the visual system. We know that when you look at, say, something, in this case, say, the letter M, that the back of the brain, the primary visual cortex, actually maps that M on precisely within the cortex. So given the advances over the last 30 years, we set out to see, could we actually see that mapping in detail in the cortex of the brain. So we did a simple experiment where we exposed the subject to that letter M. Now, when you look at the brain surface, of course, the surface of the cortex is kind of like a crumpled piece of paper. Very hard to see what's going on. But with our advanced computational tools, we can essentially take that raisin, and plump it back up to the grape. And when we do that, we can see within the cortical surface exactly what that subject was looking at. Uh, that's the letter M that the subject was looking at. Uh, here it is. This is what the brain sees when your eyeball and your retina uh, sees the letter M. Now, of course, we uh, set out to uh, try to spell the MGH Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. 
Well, okay, so at this stage, we just uh, stop with the MGH, but I think this uh, simple example uh, highlights some very interesting facts. For example, the fact is that our primary visual cortex also activates when we imagine visual scenes, and also when we're dreaming. Those visual scenes that we dream about also activate the primary cortex, which suggests and at least raises the question as to whether we can ultimately see facets of your thoughts and dreams. And I'll have to say that the current technology would give at least a qualified yes to this question. Now, of course, we're extremely interested in using these tools to watch the function of different brain regions and their connectivity uh, during uh, psilocybin experience and following thereafter. This is an example from colleagues of ours, close collaborators at uh, uh, Copenhagen University Hospital in Denmark, uh, which have shown that pre-drug this uh, uh, issue of the interaction between the default node uh, default mode network that Jerry uh, mentioned, the areas of uh, activation uh, in the front uh, and rear of the brain. With time following psilocybin, this is 40 minutes later, notice that that back of the brain is disconnected from the front part of the brain. And this stays disconnected for uh, 80 minutes out, even uh, two hours out, uh, and it's not until uh, almost uh, 300 minutes uh, later that we begin to see some reconnection of those parts of the brain. This uh, uh, disruption, uh, uh, dissolution of network activity is one of the things that we're keenest to study uh, with the tools that we now have at our disposal. Of course, one of the nice things about uh, working at the Martino Center is that we now have the ability to advance this into truly second by second dynamics of brain networks as uh, shown here from our colleague uh, Randy Buckner's uh, work. So with this ability, we can actually watch the networks of the brain uh, changing, not just over a matter of tens of minutes, but literally second by second. And so it allows us the possibility of seeing networks in the brain, like the default mode and many others, reorganized during psychedelic treatment. And then of course we can study how they stay reorganized as a result of the plastic changes um, uh, that we've, uh, we're just hearing about. Now, in addition to being able to see function with tools like MRI, we also want to study the molecular effects of the brain. We know, for example, that psychedelics uh, act on the 5H2A receptors, a particular neurotransmitter receptor uh, in the brain. And here we can actually show that uh, psilocybin directly binds to those 5H2A uh, receptors. Again, the work of our uh, colleagues uh, in uh, at Copenhagen. Uh, but what we're able to do at the Mass General, uh, uniquely, is to combine these tools, for example, in this case, looking at the 5-HD transporter and its uh, uptake in the serotonergic-rich cells in the uh, uh, medial and dorsal raphe nucleus, the DR and the MR, and combine that with MRI. We have a new generation of instruments that literally places a PET scanner inside an MRI scanner. Here's the back of it uh, with the uh, cover removed. And the result is that we can actually look at network connectivity specifically to those areas where the uh, transporters and neuroreceptors are expressed. Uh, this will give us a unique ability to connect these network maps with the neurochemistry of the brain, something that really uh, no other place uh, in the world is able to do the way we can. Now, the final thing I'd like to talk about is another way that we think about the connections in the brain, and that's the, literally the wiring of the brain. You've probably seen pictures like this, both in the scientific literature, uh, in the uh, uh, popular uh, press scientific literature, and even in artistic settings, like this album cover from the uh, 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 band Amuse. These beautiful pictures of brain wiring actually come from MRI tools that were developed first uh, at the Mass General, um, uh, and uh, which we've now taken to wholly new heights. This is the back of uh, what we call our ultimate brain connection machine or the connectome. It's got almost 10 times the strength and power of a conventional MRI scanner to see these connections and almost 10 times faster way of looking at it. Now it takes a lot of power to do this, 22 megawatts of power, about the same as a Los Angeles class nuclear submarine. Uh, but with that power, we can now see the brain's wiring in exquisite sensitivity in a way that we've never been able to do before. And of course, that gives us the opportunity to look for rewiring the brain uh, following uh, treatments, to look for this brain plasticity uh, physically in the wiring of the brain in unique ways. So 
new tools we believe do lead to great uh, discoveries. This quote from Freeman Dyson, I think nicely sums it up. New directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than new concepts. Concept-driven revolutions are useful because they explain old things in new ways, but a tool-driven revolution is able to allow us to discover new things that have yet to be explained. There are great new discoveries that we will make with our unique tools. And I'm so excited to have the opportunity to work with Franklin and the rest of the team that you'll be hearing from about integrating their exciting and new tools with our own to finally understand how these drugs uh, are working and how best to design new treatments that are even more effective. And with that, thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Dick. Thank you so much, Bruce. That's like amazing. Um... Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Stephen Haggerty, Steve, who is a steward and Suzanne Steele Associate Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School and Director of Chemical Neurobiology for this center. Steve's research is focused on understanding how the mechanisms of neuroplasticity can be harnessed therapeutically to treat mental illness, and he'll share how the center will be using patient-derived stem cells to give us insight into how psychedelics can impact patients on an individualized basis. He has a long-standing interest also in how natural products can be used as tools to probe biological systems and to develop new medicines. Steve. Great, thanks Dick for the uh, introduction here. I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to speak to you all about some of the fundamental neuroscience that we're really excited about bringing into uh, the Center for Neuroscience uh, of Psychedelics. Just to summarize what the real vision is here from a neuroscience perspective, um, as was already introduced to you, uh, we want to really build a collaborative research network, not only amongst academics, but also industry, that will allow us to advance our understanding of the fundamental molecular, cellular, and ultimately network level um, changes in neuroplasticity that we think occur as a result of treatment um, with a therapeutic psychedelic. One of the concepts that we want to introduce into this approach, though, is borrowed from the fields of other areas of medicine, namely advances then in the field of precision medicine, that begins to think about answering the question, how do we get the right drug at the right time um, to the right patient? And for this activity, one of the technologies we're really excited to bring into the center here is this remarkable ability then to use so-called reprogramming technology to take a skin sample from a particular patient, for example, that might be treatment resistant depression, and reprogram that into the stem cell. That stem cell then, and that technology is a Nobel Prize winning um, development, allows us to study a variety of cell types then in the human body. In our context, we're able to differentiate these in into different types of neural networks that are formed in the dish. This allows us to begin modeling the very basic disease mechanisms, but more excitingly allowing us then access to the kinds of cells and circuits that we think are disrupted in a variety of neuropsychiatric diseases. We think this is going to be important for understanding at a fundamental level how therapeutic psychedelics actually modulate mechanisms of neuroplasticity and will lead us then to develop potential new biomarkers uh, as well as an improved understanding of new targets. Our basic approach here is to grow these stem cells from patients then, and little wells in a plate here, such as a 96 well plate, allowing them to differentiate over this time course here of around two weeks to form these neural networks. I still find it remarkable that we can go from a patient skin sample to a neural network in the dish and now begin studying human neuropharmacology. This is exciting and potentially transformative because it allows us to make an intimate and deep connection then back to the patient and really begin to humanize, if you will, this process of understanding the mechanisms of psychedelics and advancing the discovery uh, of new ones. We're excited to perform all sorts of functional assays then here, looking not only at the very basic signaling mechanisms, such as those regulated by the 5-HT2A receptor that Bruce just introduced to you, but also some of the downstream changes in gene expression and electrophysiology that are thought to occur, but now actually can be measured and studied at an individual patient uh, neuron level. One of the other really exciting developments in this field is that we're not actually constrained to just studying networks then that form in a flat two-dimensional structure, but through advances in stem cell biology, we can now begin studying little three-dimensional mini-brains, so-called cerebral organoids, as depicted on the slide here. 
these remarkable structures then begin to um, look like um, the structures that one might find in regions of the cortex and brain of an individual with the different cell types and their organization into a three-dimensional shape. Very excitingly though, to these organoids, we can add other cell types, again, differentiated from those stem cells, for example, cells of the immune system that allow us to begin to look at potential interactions related to neuroinflammation. And one of our main projects that we're launching here, as we call the psilocybome, um, aims to deeply profile and characterize the level of the genome, the transcriptome, all of the genes turned on, the proteome, all of the proteins that might be regulated, and ultimately physiology uh, in response to various psychedelic agents. And again, I think this is just a remarkable technology to bring um, into um, the field at this point. But our ultimate goal with these profiling and testing molecules is really to try to connect with our clinical colleagues and begin to um, impact ultimately treatment of patients. And so we're excited to build a cohort here of patients that have gone through the type of advanced neuroimaging that Bruce introduced to you and have deep phenotypic and clinical information accumulated, as Franklin described and characterize individual neurons. And our hope then is that through these studies um, that we're performing in the lab, we can begin to help understand how certain patients might respond to certain psychedelics or be a non-responder, and in doing so help guide the efforts overall to advance precision medicine. Now, we're interested in doing this not only for existing psychedelic agents, but one of the exciting things that I'm really passionate about here is to kind of go back to the beginning, if you will, to understand sort of the origins of some of the discoveries that we have in the field. And pioneering work by individuals such as Richard Evan Schultes, a Harvard professor of botany, and many others in the field then that produced the foundation from which we're building on now through their discoveries of the bioactivities of a variety of different plants and fungi has really created this incredible roadmap and potential guide for the future then to understand aspects of neuroplasticity and impact mental health. And going back and reading these studies and the legacy then that our um, botanists, our mycologists, and in some cases, even phycologists have brought forward to the field then is really exciting. And these pioneering papers then that describe these activities uh, first for the first time is now just a real goldmine to bring forward and now study then in the context of these human neurons. And so we plan to leverage then advances that just weren't possible back in the days in the 40s and 50s and 60s when this pioneering work was done. Um, at the level of natural product chemistry, our understanding now of the signaling pathways, but really this ability to study these different small molecules and compounds uh, in the types of human neurons. And with that, I'll just sort of end and summarize that we really think that by fundamentally understanding the mechanism of action of psychedelic drugs, this is not only going to provide really critical insight into the mechanisms of neuroplasticity and mental health in general, but by studying mechanism, we can understand are there new targets that we can use to develop new drugs then that have even improved um, properties. And then by considering this question, can we really identify the right drug for the right patient at the right time? Uh, we hope that we can really enhance the clinical uh, efficacy of these agents. Uh, and with that, Dick, I'll turn it back uh, to you. Great, well, thanks so much, Steve. Um, I can't wait to see what you, you're gonna be finding as you begin analyzing all those samples in, in Schulte's Harvard Connect collection with, with all the resources that you have to bring to bear. So thank you. Next, an exemplar of the promise for physician scientists to shape the future of medicine and psychiatry in particular, Dr. Sharman Ghaznavi is Associate Director of this Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics and the cent also the Center's Director of Cognitive Neuroscience. Dr. Ghaznavi al also serves as a psychiatrist at the Dalton Family Center for Bipolar Treatment Innovation and an instructor at Harvard Medical School. After several, among several research interests, she's been leading an initiative within the Department of Psychiatry to research rumination as a transdiagnostic phenomenon. Sharman's going to speak about how neuroplasticity came to be the lens through which the center studies psychedelics interaction with the brain. And we'll talk about one of the early studies we'll be doing. Sharman. Thank you for that, Dick. So, um, as my colleagues have just shown you, at MGH, we are truly fortunate to have a broad and experienced clinical base, as well as some extraordinary tools for probing the human brain, from neurons and dishes to networks of brain regions underlying human thought, emotion, and behavior. 
Now the question is, how are we gonna to bring together this clinical expertise, advanced neuroscience and psychedelic compounds to work towards advancing treatments for our patients? So you've heard doctors Rosenbaum and Haggerty refer to neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is our brain's ability to adapt to our experiences and the environment to grow, form new connections, and rewire as necessary. This ability is critical to our growth and development. Just as we are works in progress, so are our brains. It turns out that factors that are important for promoting neuroplasticity are decreased in psychiatric illness, be it depression, anxiety, an eating disorder, substance abuse, or schizophrenia. What's more, in our patients with treatment-resistant illness, this decreased capacity is likely pronounced. Why does this matter? Because healing relies on neuroplasticity. All of our treatments work by inducing growth and changes in the brain. Here, here we have four sections taken from rodent brains. The first is without any treatment. Section B is following treatment with an older antidepressant, a tricyclic. Section C is following treatment with ECT. And section D is following treatment with an SSRI, WASD. If you take a close look at sections B, C, and D, you'll notice these black flecks. Those are precursors to new neurons. And so one of the ways in which our treatments work is by promoting the growth of new neurons. Now, if you think about our patient with treatment-resistant depression, patient who's having difficulty getting out of bed despite multiple medication treatments and therapy, one of the reasons our treatments may be failing that patient is because their brain, either due to the course of their illness or predisposing factors, does not have the capacity to change and grow in the way necessary for our treatments to work and for them to heal. And this is where psychedelics come in. Preliminary research shows that psychedelics hold the promise of robustly promoting neuroplasticity. Here we see DMT and LS, the effects of DMT and LSD on cortical neurons taken from rodents. If you'll notice these bright yellow projections, those are new synapses demonstrating the robust growth that psychedelic compounds can promote. This neuroplasticity might explain why we see clinical improvement in our patients with treatment-resistant illness after even just a single dose of a psychedelic compound, and why those clinical improvements are sustained. Now, it's important to note that neuroplasticity happens at all levels in the brain. Neuroplasticity happens at the level of neurons, as we've just seen, as well as brain regions and the connections between brain regions. And then finally realized in cognition, emotion, and behavior. If we think back to for a patient with treatment-resistant depression or treatment-resistant illness. Imagine if we could harness the knowledge of how psychedelics promote neuroplasticity and use that knowledge to move the dial on the capacity for change and healing. While we envision the center as growing in scope and influence over time, to span different patient populations and explore different psychedelic compounds. At our outset, we will have three foundational studies focused on treatment-resistant depression and psilocybin. Our first study will look at psilocybin for rumination in patients with treatment-resistant depression. This was the study that Dr. Rosenbaum referred to and sort of what kicked things off. Our second study will look at psilocybin on cognitive, the effects of psilocybin on cognitive and emotional processing specifically salience processing and cognitive reappraisal, two processes which are key in mental illness. Salience processing refers to how we select for information in our environment, given limited attentional resources. Patients with depression have a bias for processing negative information, and that bias ends up maintaining and worsening depressed states. Cognitive reappraisal is how we reframe our experiences in order to modulate our emotions. Patients with depression are less effective at utilizing this uh, coping strategy. Our third study will look at psilocybin for personality traits, 
specifically neuroticism and extroversion in patients with treatment-resistant depression. As Franklin mentioned, personality traits can predispose to mental illness, such as neuroticism. They can also confer protection. Previously, personality traits were thought to be immutable. However, preliminary research with psychedelics shows that they have the capacity to change personality traits. Now, to give you a sense of how we hope to realize our vision as a center, I want to invite you to see how our first study took shape and how we, and how we will be conducting it. So, as Dr. Rosenbaum said, we began with our clinical experience with patients. We recognized that a great deal of suffering came from our patients' tendency to engage in rumination, going over and over in their minds the ways in which they don't measure up or the negative experiences that they've had. We come to learn that the very same regions or brain regions that show increased activity with rumination are the brain regions that show decreased activity with psilocybin. So we got to thinking, perhaps psilocybin could be used to affect change in the brain to reduce our patient's tendency to engage in rumination. To explore this possibility, we'll take patients with treatment-resistant depression, all of whom ruminate, and give them a single dose of psilocybin. Before, during, and after, we will obtain neuroimaging to identify neural correlates and predictors of change. We'll also take fibroblasts, which Dr. Haggerty's group will use to develop patient-specific neurons and brain organoids. With those, he'll be able to explore how psilocybin affects specific neurons and the brain organoids. As our study progresses, we imagine that the cognitive neuroscience and molecular neuroscience will influence each other. So for instance, the neuroimaging might identify certain neuron types that are worth exploring further in the lab. Similarly, work on neurons in the lab might suggest specific receptors we should focus on with neuroimaging. Ultimately, our hope is that both lines of research will inform patient care. In the case of our first study, we hope that psilocybin proves effective for treating rumination. We also hope that the neuroimaging will provide us with some clues about how that change is realized in the brain and how we might use that information to uh, determine response, potentiate response, and even potentially achieve the same effects with neuromodulation or some other treatments. With the molecular neuroscience, we hope to show that this patient-specific factors that can identify treatment response, as well as factors in the environment of, of nerves and cells, which might facilitate and even enhance treatment. And so our vision as a center is to understand how psychedelics promote neuroplasticity and enhance the brain's capacity for change in order to optimize current treatments, develop new and better ones, and ultimately render the term treatment resistant obsolete. Thank you. Back over to you, Jerry. Thank you, Sharman. Uh, thank you all. Th and thanks to my colleagues for uh, really extraordinary, compact explanations of the very uh, exceptional work that you do and will do. You know, uh, with respect to the current psychedelic agents, we expect that the deeper understanding of mechanism of action, as you've heard us talk about, will uh, be a guide to discovery of novel enhanced therapeutics. But we also think that uh, this work will further legitimize the available agents, that people will understand them um, as, uh, as molecular agents um, that have profound and important um, eff effects on the human brain. And in one sense, um, we're making up for decades of lost opportunity. But the, on, on the other hand, as you've heard today, the ability to do what we intend to do relies on the scientific progress of the day. It really could not have been done before. And when you think of, of this team that you've just heard for, from, as strong as it is, as a vanguard, with plans for this center to grow, bringing early career scientists on board to make this their professional focus, 
and with intention to engage with scientists and labs within and across our extended academic communities. So we very much hope that the interest that you brought to us today is sustained and we get to pursue this vision together. Um, we've left time uh, for more comments and discussions and question and answer. And I'd like now to ask Dick to guide us through the next phase of our salon um, uh, with a question and answer discussion, but first a, a special guest. Yeah, so uh, let me remind people, if you have questions, there's a, a question and answer, Q&A button, and just press the Q&A button, put in your question, and, uh, and we'll be addressing them. Great, well, well the special guest that uh, Jerry was referencing is Dr. Katya Malavskaya, Malavskaya, who's the co-founder and head of research and development of Compass Pathways and a good friend. Katya, can you explain why in particular centers and research like this now is such an important time. And um, thank you, Katya, for your gracious support for the center. Of course, uh, it's my pleasure. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so maybe I can just um, um, start a little uh, back. Um, I'm a physician, I was trained in internal medicine and I was trained on a model, I was a, an intensivist, so I was trained on the model when I would walk into the room and see the patient in distress and you know run some tests, order treatments, and then the patients would, majority of patients would get better. So I was very solution oriented and had faith in modern medicine um, and the abilities of uh, modern medicine to help patients. So when my son went to um, college in an OCD and literally crashed with, with depression, I had um, full confidence that we'll be able to help him and um, we'll get him the best help, which we did and nothing worked. Nothing really worked. And um, the when I was on receiving end of um, receiving care, uh, I realized that there are many opportunities for excellence. And I realized that um, psychiatry, it hasn't been innovation in psychiatry for a long time. And we desperately, desperately need that. So we've made, my husband and I, we've made it our life's goal to accelerate patients access to innovation in mental health and we um, supported research philanthropically and we formed a company that is dedicated to uh, the same goal of accelerating patients access to innovation and so in my role in compass as a chief innovation officer i see every opportunity through this lens of innovation and the key question when i see the opportunity the key question that i ask is will this research advance patients care will this research advance our understanding of disease mechanisms and will it uh, lead to transformation uh, in patients outcomes and it doesn't matter whether it's industry or profit, nonprofit, doesn't really matter to us from the, um, you know, as a private individual uh, from, you know, on the personal level, it really doesn't matter to me uh, whether I have an opportunity to invest or support, um, a, you know, research philanthropically. The only thing that really matters is that it would advance the patient's um, care and our understanding. And when I um, first met Jerry and the team at MGH and Charmin, um, I thought there is a tremendous opportunity. And then I learned about Martina Center and the unparalleled imaging um, opportunities there and biotechnology. Uh, everything that MGH has to offer. So um, it was really a no brainer by the, um, by nature of, you know, doing psychedelic research, being in this um, field, uh, we have a front row seat to, you know, all innovation in mental health, neuroscience, um, psychiatry and psychedelics. Um, and we can invest or fund any opportunities, but uh, that was really um, at the top of our list because we really truly believe that the combination of 
MGH um, clinical and scientific expertise and um, uh, neuroimaging and biotechnology and all the collaborations that MGH has with Broad Institute, with MIT and other institutions uh, would definitely lead to breakthrough discoveries that will advance our understanding of uh, mental illness and mental health, hopefully. So uh, we're very excited about this and hope to continue this collaboration. Katya, thank you so, so much. Very, very much. Awesome. Pleasure. So um, first question for the panelists, and, and basically, remember, keep submitting. We've got a lot of questions here. Um, and we will get to as many of them as possible. So first is really for Jerry. Uh, the center, in partnership with MAPS, will be doing a study around social isolation using MDMA and veterans suffering from PTSD. Can you talk both about why the veteran population and what that study might look like? And you might also want to mention home base and, and why MGH is particularly well suited. Yeah, thank you, Dick. Uh, uh, and that you brought up an important question. Uh, as Franklin mentioned earlier, MDMA is an important member of the class of, of drugs that we are uh, interested in studying. And um, uh, in as much as Mass General is the home to this extraordinary public-private partnership uh, for the care of uh, veterans uh, called the Home Base Program, and I, I urge those of you who are interested in PTSD and, and, and uh, the, wound, uh, 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 the Invisible Wounds of War that take a look at our website at Home Base. Not only do we take care of thousands of people locally um, in, uh, in the New England region, but uh, home base uh, uh, brings in thousands of veterans every year, uh, flies them in, puts them at hotels for two week intensive and four day intensive programs, um, and has literally reached out to tens of thousands of veterans through its direct care and, uh, and, and, re and remote services. So having that resource at Mass General um, uh, is a tremendous opportunity. At the same time, uh, in our uh, Center for Anxiety and Traumatic Stress Disorder, uh, some of our uh, clinician scientists have had a particular interest on the role of loneliness and social connection as a driver of psychopathology, and so put together a proposal to look at uh, MDMA in PTSD, but focusing on the role of loneliness and social connection as the mediator or the driver of the response. We had this proposal out to uh, funding uh, uh, through the uh, Warrior Care Network and, and uh, has still been waiting for some time and perhaps because of COVID, uh, I think they may have suspended that. But I had the tremendous uh, good news just today that uh, some of the initial funding necessary for this study, enough to get us launched, um, has arrived and this will be a study that we'll be doing with the support of MAPS. Uh, I had a conversation with Rick Doblin so many months ago, but I wish to do this, and um, it really is gratifying that we're we're now um, on the e on the edge of getting this underway, um, and we'll be able to get the team in place and take advantage of the 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 opportunity that our home based program offers to do this work. Great, thank you very much, Jerry. Um, I mean, it's it's so promising. Uh, a question for Steve. Can you give an example of the type of discoveries that you hope will come from screening botanical extracts and compounds in your new human stem cell based system analysis? If we had a couple hours, I could probably fully answer that question. But I think the short of it is, you know, going back and reading these, you know, pioneering works by Schultes and colleagues and mycologists who've characterized all sorts of other fascinating natural products from mushrooms and sorts, you know, it seems to me that um, sort of the sky's the limit in what's possible here. There's real clues from those early ethnobotanical studies of what the potential effects might be on processes like cognition. Schultes in particular described a series of roughly 20 different plants from the northern Amazon that would be what we would consider potential cognitive enhancers. And it's those agents that we want to go back to and now study with sort of advanced um, neuropharmacology and uh, chemistry to it. 
I think there's also some maybe secrets to be learned um, from the existing agents. Um, some of these metabolites are really interesting to study uh, from the existing psilocybin and related um, you know, plants and that. So um, I think beyond psychedelics, there's some really interesting antidepressants themselves out there um, to think of um, looking at. So just a tremendous, I think, goldmine for us to go through and work with. Thank you very much. Um, next would be a question for Franklin. Um, can you speak about the specifics of pr protocols you're developing around training and educating therapists? Um, as a way, I mean, there's a shortage in this field, or there will be a, a major shortage in this field of trained therapists to do this work. And can you speak some, uh, both as to the protocol and um, overall education and the role that MGH and the work you are doing can play? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, the Psychiatry Academy is a very unique portion of MGH's psychiatry department, given the reach and span that, that we have. Um, and so we're working with them on a couple of different things. I do want to mention a little bit more just about the educational component, because I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding on the part of clinicians who will eventually be able to refer their patients. And so many doctors, including psychiatrists, really know very little about psychedelics. And so we're working with them to develop an educational course for psychiatrists specifically about psychedelics. The Psychiatry Academy also provides training courses for various different forms of therapy for areas of the world or of the country that may not have the resources to train people in things like CBT or acceptance and commitment therapy, for example. And so we're working with them to sort of consider ways that we could actually bring more therapy training um, to places that may not be able to actually access training courses. I think as far as the protocols are concerned, some of our studies are still in development, but we're obviously working with a lot of the pioneers, many of whom we're thankful are actually on this, this meeting right now, to make sure that we have the proper protocols in place. And many of those are modeled in one form or another on some of the psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy models developed by Stan Groff. Unmute. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ne next is a question. Um, have there been any, has there been any mapping or, and will there be any mapping of the neurological effects that occur during psychedelic assisted psychotherapy? In other words, what is the heal, what is the potential healing role of the relationship between the client and the therapist during a psychedelic assisted event as evidenced neurologically? Uh, that's a great question. Maybe I can start with that and others will go in. It, interesting that it's the radiologist to, uh, to start with that. Uh, I'll defer to my colleagues, but uh, while to the best of my knowledge, uh, nobody has done that experiment uh, in the setting of psychedelics, we have actually been uh, now working specifically to develop the technologies that allow us to scan uh, both uh, uh, a, a subject uh, and a practitioner at the same time. This is something we call hyperscanning and actually allows us to directly look at how uh, the brains of each the uh, participant, uh, both uh, the subject as well as the uh, 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 therapist, are, are interacting during a therapeutic intervention. Our initial studies uh, led by one of my colleagues, Vitaly Napadao, have been focused on pain and actually uh, the use of uh, acupuncture. Uh, but it would be uh, uh, challenging, but definitely possible to be able to directly look uh, at the neurological changes that occur in the specific setting of a therapeutic intervention uh, during the course of psychedelics. Uh, maybe not the very first experiment uh, that we would want to do, but something that the technology now allows us to do. And since I think everyone here acknowledges how important that therapeutic interaction is, and not just the effect of the drug on itself, I think it's a necessary experiment, and I'm glad for the question. Does anyone else want to add a comment or should? All right, um, great. Well then Bruce, let, let me, since you're, you're on screen, let me ask you a question. Um, the technology that we've gotten, the technology is amazing. Can you talk about why 10X power is helpful and what we'll learn? Why do we actually care and how does this benefit, how can this benefit patients? Uh, it's a, a super uh, good question, uh, Dick. One of the 
things that we've learned for our initial uh, studies using this uh, new connectome technology is that the brain is wired in a way that we just had no understanding of before. Uh, it turns out that uh, the brain's connections are almost like woven cloth with kind of grids of fibers crossing in different directions. And that uh, 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 information is conveyed uh, not just from point A to point B, but uh, at each of these crossings has the potential to be uh, signals to be distributed to far-flung different areas of the brain. We think it's quite possible that very subtle changes at a cellular and molecular level that occur at these crossings may be the key to this kind of plasticity that people are seeing. And it suggests how even very uh, subtle changes in the underlying cellular and molecular uh, processes can lead to wide scale changes in how the brain is wired. So this is something that we just couldn't see with the uh, kind of conventional technology, why we basically set out to build an instrument that nobody had before. Uh, and as a result, we're very excited to be able to uh, uh, turn this instrument to be able to look for evidence that may uh, indicate this kind of uh, uh, widespread uh, plastic changes that occur uh, in these very small parts of the brain. You're muted, Dick. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, next question. Have you or are you considering studying psilocybin analogs, such as norcilocin nor or beocysteine or others, and or the potential entourage effects on neuroplasticity or on neurogeneration? And secondly, any thought about potentially at some point looking into the possible benefits or, or not of regular microdosing over the long term for those suffering from progressive dementia, depression, and other diseases? Maybe I'll start with an answer on that, uh, Dick, because certainly something we're really excited about is assembling the full collection of known psilocybin-related compounds, such as the ones you mentioned there of norcilocin, um, beocystin, and others, to really look at how they may be functioning synergistically. And that's one of the things that our little tiny wells and culture systems will let us explore um, quite systematically making these combinations. And that's what I mean. I think there's a really interesting history to go back to and learn from some of our colleagues in the field of mycology about some of the agents that we should be comparing and profiling. And we're excited to take suggestions of compounds that we should test. And then I think in terms of the second question about thinking about maybe dementia and what might happen with sort of lower doses, Again, we're really excited to look at some of these effects in relationship to very small doses that can be simulated then before maybe an experiment in a patient um, looking for beneficial effects on plasticity. So things where we might simulate what would happen with those low, um, low dose exposures. We have access to some amazing models of neurodegeneration, you know, created from patients with different types of dementia that'll let us then span the gamut here of classical psychiatric diseases to dementia and components of that, not just of neurodegeneration in the sense of neuron loss, but aspects of neuroinflammation, which are increasingly looking like they may be an important component of drivers of these diseases. And so I think a great opportunity for synergy here um, between molecules and these types of experiments. Anyone else? Sir? Okay. Um, next question. Uh, this is addressed to Charmin. Uh, what, and anyone else who wants to add, what ways are you looking at partnering with other organizations? So um, at present, we have collaborations with the Broad Institute and Harvard and Compass Pathways, who's sourcing the psilocybin, as well as um, MAPS in order to to supply the MDMA that we'll be using for the study that Jerry mentioned. You're muted, Dick. Uh, Jerry, would you like to talk a little bit about the, would you like to talk about the uh, potential collaborations um, between it with other institutions and the like. Uh, you have a long history of uh, everyone loving to collaborate with you. Can you just talk to that? Can you so, talk to that just a bit? So we, we, 
we, as, as you mentioned, and I think I made a comment in my opening remarks that uh, we view our uh, other institutions who are engaged in this effort as our allies. And um, we've had some preliminary, very preliminary communications about working together. But, uh, you know, we're early ourselves. We're, we're you know, we, what we've created and launched has made us real. We've uh, obtained a, now north of a $2 million to fund our initial studies. And, uh, but our, our goals and ambitions really require us to uh, partner with and collaborate with all who uh, uh, share our vision and have the, the tools and the will um, to explore the same questions that uh, we're uh, taking on. Um, it's what we do. I mean, uh, it, it, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're, we're at a, a hub where collaboration drives everything, you know, uh, in, this, in this universe at MIT and Harvard Medical School and Harvard University and Mass General and the biotech industry. Um, what, where, where we end up, and I think it was reflected in Katja's uh, comments as well, uh, that we have to be a hub. We have to be a node that people uh, connect through. I like to think of ourselves as kind of a carbon atom to which other um, molecules attach and, and, and give rise to life. Great. Uh, that's a beautiful metaphor. So, um, uh, Sherman, you had talked about your current area of research as it pertains to those with treatment-resistant depression. How do you envision being able to apply what you learned through those studies across other psychiatric illnesses and patient populations? So, um, Dick, you know, if we if we look at the first study, which is looking at rumination, you know, we like to think of rumination as sort of self-reflection gone awry, to sort of capture the fact that it's pervasive across psychiatric illness. So there isn't a, a single patient population that doesn't ruminate, and for whom rumination doesn't cause suffering or worsen their symptoms. So our, the results of our initial study could very well inform how we treat rumination in other patient populations and give us a better understanding of how it perpetuates um, symptoms and sustains them. Um, and you know, in terms of future studies, whatever we learn, we can use towards preventing illness and as well as treating illness. So for instance, we thought about um, how we could take this information to prevent illness in patients who are in family members of patients um, who are at risk for developing an illness. Uh, just, so just imagine, we, we, have a, we have been in talks with um, Dr. Daphne Holt, who looks at high-risk individuals in the college population. And just imagine if we took our research and were able to apply it there and prevent a whole another generation from suffering. Absolutely. Um... There's been a lot of focus given to treatment-resistant depression, major depressive uh, disorder, and PTSD. What are you thinking about other psychiatric conditions, and when do you envision you will be able to be starting research into them? And is anxiety not generally included in psychedelic research? So, uh, you know, you really can't study uh, the people who suffer depression without studying anxiety simultaneously um, because the coexistence of anxiety symptoms or anxiety disorder with depression is, is more the, uh, the rule than the, the exception. Uh, PTSD was once thought of as an anxiety disorder and is now under a separate classification. And certainly um, fear symptoms and anxiety are, are prominent in PTSD. Um, our approach also really, as, as, uh, as uh, Sharman outlined with rumination, is not so much to focus on specific diagnostic categories within the DSM, but on um, components of, uh, of uh, human suffering that, that are transdiagnostic, that cut across di diagnoses. And so certainly uh, uh, observations of uh, uh, an impact on fear circuitry and anxiety symptoms Will be featured in all, all we do. Uh, again, um, we had to pick the area we areas we focus on at the start, and in the beginning, it it's um, it really is a focus on depression and PTSD. But uh, you know, as we go forward, as we create new collaborations um, and uh, engage with other 
researchers, I'm certain that we will expand more specifically into a focus on anxiety. Yeah, my own role right now in the institution is to direct an anxiety disorders program, the Center for Anxiety and Traumatic Stress Disorder. So that will always be uh, uh, on my uh, agenda. Um, we are actually already proposing outside of the, the, the basic science uh, uh, focus, a, a, some uh, uh, ketamine assisted therapies for comorbid PTSD and depression uh, in an outpatient setting. So, so we're, we're in the space of anxiety for sure. Great, thank you. Um, another question, absolutely incredible research, thank you so much. Whether it's control groups or otherwise, might you be looking at, is any of your work going to be looking at the long-term effects of psychedelics on a psycho-spiritual level or other effects on healthy individuals? I don't want to take up all the screen, but inevitably the answer is yes. I mean, we we uh, we imagine that you know, as I think, as significant as what we have created at the start, what we have already. I mean, if this was all we did, I guess it would be interesting and a contribution. But our uh, our vision and hopes are are uh, much broader, and uh, and we expect to be expanding out and exploring so many. Uh, n new implications of uh, of this field that the uh, the answer would be yes. Great, great. Um, how can love this question? How can they be, people become more involved if they would like to? Well, you know, I'd say watch this space, stay connected. We're good. As uh, uh, Dick, you mentioned in the beginning, we're going to be having a. A series of uh, deeper dives so that you'll hear from uh, more members of the of the center individually talking about their work so you can learn about it um, getting involved you know if, if you're a sufferer you know, you know as our studies go forward you know we'd love to hear from you uh, and um, you know obviously uh, you know us to thrive we need people who care about what we do and we hope you'll continue to care about what we do and I think Franklin um, has a, may have something to add to what I just said. Yeah, I actually wanted to address also the question about uh, nature that someone had asked and whether psychedelic assisted psychotherapy would be better administered in nature or would there be an opportunity for doing that? And it's, it's an interesting question. We had Charlie Grove from UCLA, um, who's one of the pioneers of this research, giving us grand rounds about a month ago talking about how he felt that probably the ideal place for this may have been in nature. And I think certainly some of the research settings present a challenge um, because we know that set and setting is so important. But I think as a broader question, there's a lot of unexplored terrain as to what set and setting really mean. What kinds of stuff can we study in terms of music, in terms of whether there's eye shades on the patient or not during the study, in terms of the environment. And I think also the therapy itself. So I think the psychotherapy model that we've developed is a good one, but there's a lot of unexplored terrain. And we have many psychologists, uh, including in our CATS-D clinic that I work in with Jerry, studying anxiety and uh, traumatic stress disorders, who we can bring to bear to study different forms of therapy, potentially. Could we enhance cognitive behavioral therapy with a psychedelic therapy session? Could we enhance cognitive processing therapy with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy? So I think there's a wealth of opportunity for sort of targeting the therapy, making it more unique, and seeing which is most effective. I'll just also uh, jump in very quickly to say that with the advances in uh, the creation of virtual reality spaces, uh, certainly no substitute for being uh, deep in the woods, but uh, uh, there's a way that we can begin to capture some of those elements and, and even do so within you know, uh, more controlled laboratory settings. It's a challenge, but I think some very interesting opportunities there. Great, thank you. I, I just wanted to build on Jerry's comment, you know, uh, Jerry's answer just a little bit. And, you know, I want to be, I want to highlight that unlike other areas in medicine right now, there's almost no governmental funding for research related to psychedelic therapies. Now, ultimately, this will definitely change over time, but now is the moment when philanthropic dollars can and will have the greatest leveraged impact advancing the field of psychedelic treatments for mental health. 
I just wanted to make sure that people are well aware of that, be it at MGH or Maps or anywhere. Now is the absolutely pivotal moment um, for having a huge leveraged impact. Uh, the space is going through incredible changes and there are amazing opportunities. So I would just encourage, um, I would just encourage people to think about that. Another question, and we're coming toward the end of our time. I'm interested in the link between the depth of experience during a psychedelic experience and the therapeutic outcome. Are there ways that you can study the subjective nature of these experiences in a neuroscientific context? I can uh, just jump in at the very beginning. Um, one thing we uh, do know, we have um, uh, done studies that uh, uh, have measured the uh, levels of uh, 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 psilocin uh, in the blood. Uh, and it turns out uh, those levels are actually uh, quite closely uh, correlated to uh, the subjective experiences, uh, the depth of experience that you refer to. So it suggests to us that one of the important things that we do when we do these experiments is to control for, uh, say, uh, the, the body weight of the subjects, how it gets distributed, and actually measure what these levels are in the brain. And once we do so, we have a really objective measure uh, as to uh, how the neuroreceptors uh, within that uh, brain system are being uh, uh, altered. And from that, uh, can uh, use that as a, a way to better control the kind of experiences that we see from that. Great. Uh, thank you. So, Dick, if I might just add to that, you know, part of the goal of really focusing on cognitive neuroscience as well is to actually capture the functional experience of, of patients as they're undergoing the experience. And it's also one of the reasons why we're, you know, ambitiously going to image during the session as well and look at actual cognitive and emotional factors that are um, being impacted at that time. Okay, thank you. Another question, what is your psychotherapeutic protocol or are you exploring different protocols? So in other words, for those who aren't familiar, during treatment, um, are, are there a number of different psychotherapeutic uh, protocols that you're considering using or exploring or testing? So for our initial studies, we are leaning towards just supportive therapy with the idea that we want to understand how the psilocybin or these other compounds are affecting the brain independent of particular um, manipulations with therapy. Um, and just to understand what is the sort of setting that's created in the neural environment to allow a given therapy to be particularly effective. Um, but I'll hand it over to Franklin to be able to tell us a little bit more about other therapies we could explore. Yeah, I think as I mentioned, there's a lot of curiosity on how we might be able to build psychedelic assisted psychotherapy into other therapies. And so uh, the study that we were considering with MDMA would actually be building an MDMA assisted psychotherapy into a pre-existing two to three week treatment session of cognitive processing therapy and exposure therapy. And so I think there's a lot of unique opportunities to insert psychedelic assisted psychotherapy into other therapy protocols as well. Thank you very much. So um, we're coming toward the, uh, the, the end of our 90 minutes. And based on the questions submitted and everybody basically staying on, online and the like, uh, we could go on for hours. So there are, there are a few things that I'd like to do in, in, in sort of closing here. First, I really want to acknowledge the importance of the philanthropy that has made the current research agenda here and everywhere else um, advance and possible, and how important we are totally open to additional partnerships with donors, and that will be t completely key to realizing the vision that, that we're sharing here today. So I thank everybody for their questions, and I thank the amazing center leadership for the work you're doing. As mentioned, the center is going to be formally launching this fall. We're now engaged in bringing in the funds to hit key milestones in the center's formation and growth. We have deep gratitude to all of you for your time and interest in this work. We'll be sending out an overview deck as well as a recording of the call and want to remind people that Bruce Rosen will be presenting for a full hour 
in July, and each of the presenters will be offering these deep dives, so you really get to dig into to what they are, uh, the work they're doing. I'd like to turn it over to Jerry uh, to close. So uh, all that needs to be said, again, is uh, thank you for joining. Um, I think you've got a sense of uh, the team we've assembled um, and uh, our hopes and aspirations for this center. Um, if uh, where we are today was all that we had accomplished, it still would be meaningful. But um, the journey of discovery is one with a lot of uncertainty. Um, uh, it requires a lot of faith. Sometimes you get lucky early on, but uh, it requires expertise, discipline, time, and resources, all of which uh, we feel that we, are, we have in our building and we look forward to making a difference in the lives of all. So thank you again for being part of our, our afternoon and, and hopefully for being part of our future as well.